Man, did the top of WWE's card just fall apart in early 2006 because one, not only did world heavyweight champion Dave Batista get injured in a match with Mark Henry, but then a few days before New Year's Revolution 2006, Vince McMahon woke up with, hey pal, I think we should take the WWE title off John Cena. So that's exactly what they did. And there's loads of rumors at the time that John Cena was very upset about this and thought it was a direct reflection of his run, but I don't believe that for one second simply because of how long he'd held the belt. I mean, he won it at WrestleMania 21 when he defeated JBL, and then he held onto it for nine months until, yes, he did lose it at this pay-per-view. But babies were conceived in that time, and if you had any worries that John Cena wasn't WWE's new guy, a few weeks later, he won it back at the Raw Rumble. And no one ever talks about that. When Edge finally cashed in his money in the bank, it lasted all of 78 seconds, and then he lost the damn thing. The tide had already turned, though, I do give you that because on this evening, the New York crowd, which we do know can be quite ferocious, just viciously booed John Cena out the place as they decided, wait a minute, we don't appreciate this guy being stuck down our throats, so instead we will use our mouths to boo him. Going back a few steps too though, yeah, McMahon did decide to do this at the last minute, which caused Raw to be rewritten at the last minute too, so let's not pretend this is a brand new thing in the modern day. But I think what we really need to establish here is just how important this moment was, because before Edge cashed in his Money in the Bank briefcase, no one exactly knew what it meant. We knew it was exciting and we knew it was fresh like bread, but otherwise, what the hell was he gonna do with this? And soon after this, it would become an ace up WWE sleeve. I mean, think of all the mad moments we've had because of this stipulation. And it's why, I would assume, we got the live sex celebration the following night on Raw. Because somebody had to come up with something, so they said, well, sex sells. We can have Edge and Lita just pretend to bang as millions of people watch on. I'm sure we will get there at some point, though. And just for some other news as well, in January 2006, the great Carly signed with WWE and then a few months later debuted and whooped The Undertaker's ass. And over in TNA, Sting also debuted. And I say debuted, he, like, debuted properly. And the previous year, he'd kind of been in the company and out the company, but in early 2006, he made his mark and he started to become a kinder, but not kinder, full-time, total non-stop action wrestler. To get that though, because we're gonna head to the Pepsi Arena that did have 11,000 fans in it to watch New Year's Revolution 2006. And it's also where they saw one of the worst matches you could ever even imagine. Less up those doubts. New Year's Revolution 2006 is sponsored by WWE, the DVD board game. Now, I can't even remember this thing existing. So if you have a copy, please send it to me. I need to play it. Also, our commentary team is Joey Styles and the coach. And while I do appreciate WWE trying new things, I mean, that just didn't work at all. Furthermore, when Coach is talking about the Elimination Chamber during the intro, he says, well, I hope only one person walks out. And I've been trying to figure that out for days. Of course, only one person is gonna walk out. I mean, what did the Coach want? Everybody else to die? That's not very nice. The coolest thing about watching this pay-per-view back now, though, is all the foreshadowing. In fact, it's too much when you do know what the payoff is. But in the very first match on the card, you have Edge with Lita. And yes, he's got his money in the bank briefcase. But by this point, because he's held on to it so long, you kind of just forgot about it. It was just a prop he had. I mean, maybe Edge just liked briefcases because he could feel like he was going to an office job. He's also taken on Ric Flair here for the Intercontinental Championship. And Ric Flair is also the Intercontinental Champion. So my brain didn't take a memory of this at all. And because it it is WWE and because Edge was going to become the world champion at the end of the night, I predicted, because honestly I could not remember the results, will they make Edge lose here because in WWE's crazy world, if they're about to give you something big, they will just whoop your ass until that time. Clearly we did have some major plans for the rated R superstar though, because we didn't do that at all and <laughs> instead Edge lost by disqualification. So once again, let's not pretend these funny duddy finishes are a result of 2021. World Wrestling Entertainment and World Wrestling Federation and probably WWWF are just damn obsessed with them. In case you were wondering what mode WWE was in at the time as well, at one point Ric Flair not only pokes Lita in the eye, but then he gets her in the ring and he applies the figure four. 
they wouldn't even consider it now. This was shortly after the whole Edge, Matt Hardy and Lita fiasco too, so these fans are just absolutely brutal to poor Lita. I mean, you'd honestly think some kind of murderer just walked in the ring. But yeah, after a short while, Flair gets thumped with the briefcase because Ed doesn't appreciate this, which causes the disqualification. And somehow, I swear, Ric Flair is bleeding from that shot, even before the briefcase actually hits him. Because when it comes to nicking his forehead open, who better at doing it than the nature boy? Edge kicked his ass afterwards as well because he was about to go to the main event level. And I tell you what. It was actually kind of fun. I enjoyed myself picking Emmett up. I then could not believe my ears, and maybe that's why in many ways my brain has taken information from this show and chucked it in the bin. So we cut to a Kurt Angle interview, and he's being his jovial self, trying to wind up the fans, saying, oh, France is a better country than America, and talks about historical figures he'd love to tap out. And then the words that came out of his mouth, I even feel bad recounting. Because from nowhere he just goes that he's not a fan of black people. And I stood there or sat there, I was sitting at the time, and my eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger and my jaw kept getting wider and wider until it almost smashed into the floor. I mean, I feel terrible bringing it up, but it'd be worse if I ignored it. And that's not getting heat. That is just reinforcing stereotypes and bigotry and all those kind of things that we should never go near. Or if we do, they should be being presented as, hey, don't do this. It's not funny and it's not clever. And this was, of course, WWE's attempt to kind of push the envelope and get back a bit of that Attitude Era magic, even though they were long gone. And of course, Kurt has a reason for this. He's all like, I can say whatever I want and people will still cheer me. But even then, just say you like to dive into cheese and have sex with it, at least that can't wind anybody up because saying what he did say would absolutely wind somebody up and how can you argue that it wouldn't? This was just terrible, terrible. Ugh, this era of WWE can be super bad down. I was then cracking up though because you do cut back to the ring and Ric Flair is still lying in it going, oh, I can't see because he has so much blood on his head. I mean, Ric Flair and Bleeding, name a better couple. It was, however, then time for Mickie James versus Trish Stratus, who, of course, had been embroiled in this program where Mickie James was utterly obsessed with Trish. I suppose in many ways you could say it kicked off properly here. Sadly, they would go on to have much better matches than this, and it's a down. The women's title is on the line too, and it starts off well because Mickey wants to shake hands, but Trish is like, look, you a crazy stalker person. I don't want to get near you. But James feeds off of that, so in the early going, it's actually all right. The problem is, after this decent start, Mickey James tries to get out of some chain wrestling courtesy of Trish Stratus by taking her top off, or at least attempting to do so. So there's the attitude era again. And they do go for a Hurricane Rana, and Mickey James lands right on her head. The fans then lose complete interest, and you can see that both wrestlers are also a little bit flummoxed. So when Mickey James goes for a Stratisfaction, and they botch that too, I imagine they just wanted the floor to open up and eat them. Shortly after, Trish goes for it as well, but Mickey James is able to reverse that. But what she did not see coming was the chick kick that lands square right in her jaw. Down she goes, one, two, three, and Trish Stratus is your champion. Now again, this would go on to much better heights, but here, well, it just didn't really click. The things you get to relive when you go back in time too, because we then go backstage to Maria, who is interviewing herself for some reason, when she gets interrupted by Shane Helms. That's right, he's no longer the hurricane, he had retired that, and now he was just a miserable SOB. Just as he was running down Maria and everybody else though, in walked in Shelton Benjamin, and Shelton Benjamin's mama. I mean, oh, how I had forgotten about this. And Shelton doesn't dare say anything because his mum is just ripping into him, including going, have you eaten today? And he said he had a protein bar, but that's not real food. So she essentially grabs him by the ear and walks him off to catering. And look, in many ways, this was terrible. On paper, it sounds atrocious, but whoever the hell they got to play this lady is so damn over the top. I kind of enjoyed it. There was then more wink wink nudge nudge because Edge and Lita are in the WWE.com interview room. But Edge tells Lita, you're going to have to do this because I have bigger fish to fry. When I was a kid, how the hell did I not figure this stuff out? I mean, he may as well have a sign that said, oh, I'm going to cash in my money in the back briefcase in around about 90 minutes. All of that preceding stuff, though, was leading to Shane Helms versus Jerry the King Lawler which means in 2006, WWE was still obsessed with nostalgia. I mean, you have Jerry Lawler, and we also had Rickers Flair. While this is pretty simple too, clearly Lawler is in charge here, so it does go old school, including Helms getting the heat by poking Jerry right in the eye. If that doesn't sum up wrestling, I don't know what it does. 
when Ric Flair did it. Everyone was like, oh, Ric Flair, pokes up in the eye. I love him so much. But because we don't like Shane, now we think he's a piece of trash. Jerry got thrown over the top rope at one point, so he definitely had his working shoes on. And when he gets back in the ring, he goes to hit Shane Helms with the pile driver, but Shane gets out of it by giving him a back body drop. Now, I can't remember when the pile driver was banned, but we don't see it here. And it's also one of the occasions where you're like, man, we really needed the pile driver because the finish is just a little bit weak. Because Lawler just goes to the top rope and he hits his flying fish drop, which I'm sure was devastating in like 1984, but he gets the win and you can see the fans in the arena look around like, wait, what? Is that it? Did I miss something? Did he have something on his fist? But no, he's just got a really tough punch and Helms couldn't take it. Also, surely Shano should have won this for obvious reasons. We're taking all that nonsense political stuff and throwing it over there because I don't care. It was 15 years ago, whatever it was. I actually was quite sports entertained by this and I don't even know why. I'm giving it up. Fallout from Trish Stratus and Mickie James next because now it's Trish that's about to do an interview with WWE.com in this magical room when Mickie James enters and she doesn't give two hoots that she lost. And Stratus sells this as if someone's tried to steal her brain and she's like, why aren't you more upset? And as it turns out, Mickie doesn't care because all she really wanted from the match was for their skin to touch. And you can do with that whatever you will. And if you need more evidence that WWE really didn't have a clue what direction it was going in, we then cut to Shelton Benjamin and his mama in catering when the mama is interrupted by Viscera. Now, even though they are in the back, Viscera still gets entrance music. And this is when he was the sexual love machine. And he actually tries to hit on Shelton Benjamin's mama by saying, I know you're Shelton's mummy, so why don't let you be my daddy? I got that utterly wrong. Why don't I be your dad? I don't know. It was just so overworldly and it was kind of disgusting. I don't want to see this on my television. I didn't sit down to watch wrestling go, man, I hope a really big guy tries to seduce somebody's mother. But that's what WWE had decided was entertaining on this evening. And I just want to say, well, it kind of was just because of Shelton Benjamin's mum. But otherwise, well, there's more to talk about till we get there later. And then it was the big show versus Triple H. I had to check my calendar going, is this 2006? I don't remember the big show and Triple H fighting in 2006, but damn it, they did. It was also the time that show was selling an arm injury, courtesy of Triple H. But when he comes out there, he is wearing a cast so big, if you had told me this was like a work in progress infinity gauntlet, I would have believed you. It is so large, you laugh at it, and you shouldn't be laughing at somebody else's pain. To begin with two, for some reason, Nobody cares about this. They are so silent, they're sitting on their hands. I don't know whether they were storing their energy for the Elimination Chamber match, but in some spots, it's so quiet, I kind of felt a little bit awkward. The story was that Big Show couldn't use his right arm, obviously, which got even worse when Triple H grabbed the car, split it open, so now he could attack the injury. Now, Big Show does come across a little bit stupid here because he tries to choke slam Triple H at one point with his bad arm and it doesn't work. And I hope Big Show's doctor was watching going, this is why I don't spend any time with him because he just doesn't listen. The referee at one point also gets accidentally walloped by Show as he's going for a chop. And honestly, that is one of the worst ref bumps you will ever see. When, of course, Triple H uses that to go and get the sledgehammer because in 2006, flub me sideways, the game was just obsessed with this weapon. But I'm pretty sure he was sleeping with it at the time, although at New Year's Revolution, it doesn't go well at all because Big Show, using his bad hand again, why doesn't he learn? Karate chops it in two. And Triple H shells it's like, oh no, what I'm gonna do now? He still had the bad bit. Now you can just swing it with even more power because you lost the other part of the wood. I will say that no man in the history of the world has ever been this sad that a sledgehammer got broken. And yet it's only at this stage when Big Show's like, wait, I've got a left hand. Why don't I try and choke slam Triple H with that? And if Big Show was wondering why nobody was cheering for him, it was probably because he was doing stupid things like this. He is so overwhelmed by this discovery though, he isn't able to pull it off, which allows Triple H to get his half sledgehammer. He twonks him right in the head. He then hits a pedigree, although I call it more like a pedder, well nothing, I just call it a pedder because Big Show's too big and he can't link his arms. And of course, again, it's the mid 2000s, Triple H gets the win. That was as common as breathing air. Throughout the second half of this, once the cast does come off and you stop laughing at this stupid thing, this really picks up, the fans get into it a little bit more. 
I'm going to give it an up. Although I will say it does not need to go as long as it does go. Not every single match needs to be like 37 minutes. Carlito and Chris Masters then say hello. And if you can believe it, yes, they were in the main event of New Year's Resolution 2006, taking on the likes of John Cena, Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. So this was quite the night for them. And WWE absolutely wanted to do something with them. However, one, Chris Masters got popped in a wellness test and that was the end of him. And two, Carlito was branded as lazy. I don't know if he was lazy, but as soon as he was called this, that was that. I think Carlito too was well aware who he was facing both within and outside of kayfabe, because he goes to Masters here, who of course is working out because he loves his biceps and says, look, we can work together to take on everybody else. And if we do do that, one of us can be the WWE champion. I mean, they were gonna get murked otherwise. So Chris Masters agreed to this and just getting ahead of myself a little bit. It's actually quite a cool pact, which makes the main event even better and makes me sad now that we didn't do more with either of these guys. I was always a pretty big fan. If you can then believe it too, Shelton Benjamin and his mama then come to the ring. That's right, on a pay-per-view where you've already spent your hard-earned cash, WWE decided to do this. Because Benjamin is pissed that his mama did get offended and he wants Viscera to come out there and apologize. But his mum goes, no, I don't think we should do that. Viscera, please do come out to the squared circle but we're gonna have an impromptu match. And that's what happens. Why Shelton Benjamin's mama all of a sudden has booking powers, I don't know. But it is then Viscera versus Shelton Benjamin. And look, you should never watch this, but I am in quite the quandary here because yes, Shelton Benjamin's mama is once again, very entertaining throughout all of this. And once she made me laugh out loud, so what else am I to do but to give it an up? I mean, you don't even need to talk about what they're doing in the ring. For starters, she calls Viscera an ox, and I don't know why that made me chuckle, but it does. But then she's getting really worried when Shelton's being beaten up, like, oh, my baby. But when she realizes he's kind of sucking, she goes, you know what? I'm going to go get my belt. I want to see Shelton Benjamin's mum and back on TV. She also said that she was going to start beating his ass if he didn't start upping his game. And she meant it too. When Viscera leans out the ropes, she gets her purse. She thumps him right in the head. Then that allows Shelton Benjamin to kick Big Viss and he gets the one, two, three. But in the record books, it better not say Shelton Benjamin. It absolutely should be given to Shelton Benjamin's mama. She beat Viscera. There was one more moment that absolutely floored me though. And it came when I saw the maneuver known as the Visagra. So yes, that's the word pun you've ever heard in your life when it comes to the word Viagra. But what Viscera used to do is when somebody was laying down, face down on the canvas, he would lean over them and then thrust towards their rectum area. I'm trying to keep this PG. And what he was trying to achieve, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, was he trying to have pretend sex with them? Did he get something from it? Was it like a mind game? I have no idea what this was or what we were trying to do, but it got a pop from the fans. And what the flub do I know? Vince McMahon was then in the back winding up Shawn Michaels because of course they were in the midst of their feud and said, you're the first in the chamber. There's no chance in hell you're gonna win it. Shawn Michaels like, no, I'm the heartbreak kid, Jack. And I've proven the odds wrong all the time. So Vince kind of just shouts, hell eh, hell throws it over. It didn't really make any sense, but of course this will tie into the end of the match. And we then had, and I quote, what I believe was the first ever bra and panties gauntlet match. So once again, just remember what WWE's problem was in the mid 2000s. They really just needed to move on. But this is genuinely dreadful. So much I couldn't even say the word genuinely and it's getting a brown down. This does indeed mean you get back-to-back -back matches where the aim is to rip the other person's clothes off. So you get Candice Michelle versus Maria, then you get Tori Wilson versus Maria, then you get Victoria versus Maria, and after Victoria has been successful, she of course has to take on the surprise opponents of Mae Young and Fabulous Moolah, because who doesn't want to see a couple of old people get naked? This is why I was stunned by the crowd reaction as well. As soon as their music hits, they're like, yes, yes, as if they want to see Mae Young strip down to her bra and panties. I'm not ashamed to say, I did not want to see this, even though I already knew what I was about to get. Because you do get old woman nudity on this show, because Mae Young just gets in the ring and she strips off and she's wearing this weird bra. Victoria then really does kick her ass quite hard, but then Fabulous Mueller attacks her too, and they strip Victoria, 
Then I realized there's still one more person to come and I wanted to take my head and I wanted to throw it into a wall. Because yes, within the rules, May has lost because she took off her clothes. So out comes Ashley Mazzaro. She is able to strip Victoria. And again, because it's 2006 WWE, what does Ashley do when she is victorious? She strips off all her clothes. This would be like somebody winning a normal wrestling match and then pinning themselves it doesn't actually make any sense. Also, imagine if we did this today. Imagine we did this on Raw or SmackDown or WrestleMania Backlash. WWE would be shut down. Amazingly, this is your lead-in to the main event as well, which of course is the Elimination Chamber match for the WWE title. As you get John Cena versus Kane versus Shawn Michaels versus Kurt Angle versus Chris Masters versus Carlio. The first to win our big match, John and HBK, and you do have to give this a lot of credit. They don't muck around at all. There's some really cool sub stories going from start to finish. I had a rollicking good time and is getting it up. Before we do get there though, I do want to discuss Chris Masters entrance cloak. You remember that used to come out to da, 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 and he'd flex and look all majestic and the cloak kind of looks good but when you zoom in it has these sequence looking things just stuck on it and it honestly looks like a child had made them, snuck backstage, put them on here and Chris Martyrs never noticed. I don't really understand what we were going for. It is also laugh out loud funny because the sheer hate that John Cena starts to get makes you question what the hell he did wrong. Like if you'd never watched WWE before, but you heard, oh, there's a big pay-per-view, I'm going to tune in, you would just go, well, that must be the major bad guy in the company. So given that everybody else is doing it, I'll doing it too. And that's how the virus spread. There's more proof to this well because Carlito is the third guy in there and he decides to focus his own attacks on John Cena and the crowd erupts like The Rock has just returned to the company. The jeers are then thunderous when Cena starts to get the upper hand on him. I mean, everybody in that place must have assumed that John Cena had slapped them up. Angle is in at floor and good grief do the fans go nuts for him, which very annoyingly does prove his point from earlier. And he just goes into this routine where he's German suplexing everyone if you just want to watch one thing from this like two hour 40 card go watch this little sequence it will make you feel warm and fuzzy in your tum tum everybody just loves it we also at this point start getting suplexes to the floor on the outside of the chamber and i think this is the old structure which everybody said hurt like hell and it certainly sounds like it and then Shawn michaels gets slingshotted into the side and he's busted open like a pig he's got blood everywhere because of course whatever rick flair's gonna do Shawn michaels gonna do too eventually kurt angle gets Carlito and the ankle lock and this is also kind of amusing because they do it well too early they have to wait for the lights to go out so you get the bomb 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 who's going to be next because of course the plan is Chris Masters will get in there and he will save his new best friend from this devastating move but Carlito must be in it for around about 45 seconds the Olympic gold medalist can't have been pleased about that Masters actually has a really good flurry when he first gets in there too but he forgets that Kurt Angle is a psychopath because after he's applied the ankle lock onto Carlito he then puts it onto Masters John Cena then decides oh I better break that up for no reason that makes no sense and when John Cena is in this once again laughter comes out of my mouth he is selling it like a fish that is now on the land and has just been told we're never gonna put you back in water again he's just making motions that no human should be able to make sadly for Kurt though he was too obsessed with this so he does indeed get sweet chin music and he is the first guy out of the elimination chamber and whether it's 2006 or 2021, given that Chris Masters and Carlito was in there, who the hell saw that coming? This was also the perfect time for Kane to make his arrival. And why does WWE always do this? He is the last guy. We don't need the darkness and the boom, 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 boom to figure out who he's going to be, but we do it and it is just so stupid. I mean, what are we meant to think is going to happen? Someone's just gonna magic themselves into the chamber and go, oh, I'm in it now, and Kane's like, okay, and he walks to the back, although he may have preferred that here. Once again, he gets a few offensive maneuvers in, but then Carlito and Masters, or Masters and Carlito, or Mac, they team up on him and they get rid of him. I mean, Masters press slams Carlito above his head, throws him onto the big red machine, they then pile on top of him and get the one, two, three, and they're not done either because they then turn to Shawn Michaels. And to be fair, he gets hit with everybody's finishing move. But still, all I remember in my head is Carlito pins him and he's gone too, meaning there's only three people left and two of them are Carlito and Chris Masters. 
Why can't we do stuff like this now? I was really enjoying myself. And if anybody actually thought John Cena was going to lose here, they would have been out of their minds. And he also gets busted open after a DDT on still steps, which would tie into the fallout from it. And really, it's Carlito that goes and screws all this up. Because Chris Masters has the master lock locked on Cena at one point. And at that stage, Carlito shows his true colours. He boots Chris Masters right in the ball and uses the most devastating move in all the sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up, to get rid of him. But because he's so damn proud of himself, John Cena then uses the most devastating move in all the sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up. He pins Carlito and wins. I was so disappointed. What are you doing, Carlito? You were this close and like your apple... You spat it away. It is all about what comes next though. And once again, I really want to get this into your heads. Nobody really knew what it meant to be Mr. Money in the Bank. For example, when Vince McMahon just sorted out after this and went, oh, by the way, Edge is here, and he's allowed to have a title match right here, right now. I didn't know that. I thought maybe you had to sign a contract or do something like that, or, you know, promote it for the future. But no, we were going right into this. And honestly, you can feel the excitement in the crowd. But McMahon tells us that's exactly what the Rated R Superstar is going to do the fans are up i erupted a little bit at home as i did in 2021 and you still get one more tease here because edge hits the first spear john cena kicks out at the last second so you start going wait are we not going to do what the hell is happening edge does hit another one though and within 90 seconds we do have a brand new wwe champion and nobody in new york city can believe it and think about what this would launch think about all the things we did after this I mean, we had a flipping money in the bank through WWE HQ, but this will always be the moment we go back to and go, oh, it started here, which is why it doesn't just get an up, it gets a golden up. It made me feel all tingly. And as always, we shall end with Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer star ratings. Edge versus Flair got one and a half stars, which was the same star rating as Trish versus Mickey. And then Lawler versus Helms got one and three quarter stars. And Triple H versus The Big Show got one and a half stars. Dave, I think you're being just a little bit harsh. Especially because, and hopefully I got this wrong, hopefully it was just mixed around on the website I found them on, Shelton and Viscera got minus two stars, but the bra and panties gauntlet got minus one star. I'm sorry, at least one of these had mama in it who was entertaining. The rest was like an insult to my eyes. The Elimination Chamber got three and a half stars, which seems fair. And for some reason, he gave Cena versus Edge one star. How can you rate that thing? You didn't see nothing. It was a story angle. And once again, it made me feel good. So while it is basically a one moment show, there is some other highlights on here that it may be worth going back in time to checking out, should you so fancy. But I bet there's better stuff you could be watching as well. But overall, I think I'll give it a up. Now make sure you leave a comment below. And again, let us know what do you want us to review next week on Retro Ups and Downs. You leave a comment. Comment. whichever ones get upvoted the most go into a poll next week and the rest is self-explanatory then like the video share the video and subscribe head over to whatculture.com where you can read yourself some articles come say hello on social media and there's boxes around me click it and see what happens maybe it'll be the best thing that's ever happened to you in your life my name is Simon what culture thank you as always for joining me for retro ups and downs the journey continues i'll see you next week